uh, the first question which is actually asked the day before was on uh, books. If there are many books on a subject, uh, which is the best way to, uh, or which book should one start with? One is look at reviews or look at uh, people whom you know you can recommend. Okay. Uh, these are two ways in which you can decide. But the best way to about a subject is find a book which is easy for you to read. But before that, what I would like to ask you is, if you are a reader or not a reader, if you're not a reader, then take books, artic uh, start with articles before you start with a book. Uh, because you need to get used to the idea of uh, focusing on uh, a certain subject for a certain amount of time by reading. Uh, so therefore, that will be something which will be useful because a lot of people give up because when they take on books which are very difficult or uh, complex, uh, they may not really get into the habit of reading. Once you get into a certain uh, habit of reading, once reading becomes a part of you, then it's easy to read any book. Okay, that's one suggestion. Second, yesterday uh, there is a comment that uh, sometimes I'm using uh, words, concepts, which all of you may not be familiar with because they're technical. If that is the case, please uh, immediately ask the person who likes Shruti or okay, to stop me and ask you to explain or clarify, because it's easy if uh, concepts are clarified. If for any one of you a concept is not clear, it's possible that it is not clear to many others. Uh, I apologize because sometimes I uh, talk about uh, ideas and concepts which are very uh, familiar to me and don't think it could be not familiar to other people. So, those, so please stop me if uh, I'm using words, concepts, or ideas which are not too familiar or we want a clarification, don't wait to question answers. So right, right in the beginning, just uh, ask, uh, so ask uh, Shruti to ask me to clarify it immediately. Uh, among the questions, there is a question is in terms of why are people who are um, uh, challenging the car uh, uh, coming from the come up with alternatives. Actually, most of the activists have pointed up to six alternatives. Uh, the government has not found them feasible or may not have exported uh, uh, extensively. So there is a concern that there has not been much of dialogue. Maybe both sides will need to be a little more flexible to look at alternatives. But as I said, for me, uh, the rush through, the rush to, uh, to choose one locale immediately it's not such a priority because uh, the metro itself is not, it will take another one and a half, two years to finish. So what's the big hurry to have a car shed ready within six months or two months or three months? So some of these are things which I think we should all think about. Maybe if you um, contact NGOs, even Google and say what are the alternatives to RA for car shed, maybe some of these alternatives will uh, definitely come up. Uh, then there's a question in terms of, uh, uh, according to certain economists, the new normal uh, will not be really new. And that's something which I completely agree because we have not really changed our way of thinking, whether in terms of doing things or technology or approach uh, to economic and political and social activity. Uh, we have not really uh, found anything new. This pandemic has taken us by surprise. So even our own responses are still, we've not really figured out what is the best response. Like yesterday, somebody was saying about Sweden, uh, like Gauri was saying, that because they opened up, uh, there was a spike, there will be issues. If you also remember uh, what Raghuram Rajan said, which I quoted yesterday, he said, we have to find the best balance between saving lives and saving livelihoods. So we need to figure out, so if they're vulnerable people, how do you protect them? So the new normal, according to me, uh, will not be very different because I also see that a lot of us are not changing our mindset. So if you're not changing our mindset, it will not be very, very different uh, once the, uh, you know, the uh, threat comes down. Uh, the other question uh, is about in terms of uh, can we have a different way of examination? And the example is given of this, where they have to submit papers, and all submissions have to go through a, a, a plagiarism software check. So people can't do cut-paste. 
and uh, for certain projects and things like that in Zebes, you're already using it. It's an undivided program. Uh, so Zebes has an autonomy. It also has been able to choose uh, the kind of examination pattern. Those of us who are on the Mumbai University, uh, because Mumbai University also includes people who are uh, distance learning. So there's a lot of uh, different kinds of also people who, uh, so I don't know how much you know about Mumbai University. One of the challenges for Mumbai University is the Mumbai University ex extends from Palgar and Thane up to Savanpari. Okay. No other university in India covers such a large area. It's, uh, you know, it's across about five, six districts. And there's a large part of the students who come from what we call Mofasil areas. What is Mofasil areas? Areas which are interior, which are not uh, attached to towns, uh, small towns. Uh, so therefore, for them, access to technology, ideas, even resources. Sometimes when you're setting syllabi, uh, often a lot of syllabi is watered down because people in small towns may not be able to access a lot of text or material, and therefore we should uh, make sure that for them it is, doesn't become too difficult. So maybe in some time you'll also have to get into that mode. Also, if you look at Mumbai University or regular, if you look at our numbers, uh, whether it's projects or whatever, if you look at the first year, okay, if you look at the foundation course, okay, if it, there are about 300, 350 students, and if there are three teachers, each teacher is getting 100. Because I mean, if you look at first year, uh, for the economics, uh, and sociology and political science, there are 130, 140 students. Uh, so whether it's possible to have projects and all of that, maybe we'll have to figure out how feasible this is. So uh, your suggestion is valid. We can have better uh, methods of evaluation, uh, of approaching, of doing something that doesn't test only a memory, but looks at understanding. Postgraduate universities like uh, JNIA, what is called open book, uh, exams where the questions can come from anywhere. You should be able to interpret the question using, you can do whatever reference uh, you want in front of you. So all these are possible alternatives. So therefore that is something which uh, uh, we can definitely look at. I will, before I start with today's topic, I want to uh, introduce a, a few set of concepts. Okay. Right from the first uh, session, we are engaging with this idea in terms of governments are not doing enough or governments are not sensitive to our needs. Therefore, what could we do? So let us start looking at, when you look at the political process, uh, some of you are familiar with the three terms I'm going to use, others are not. So I will possibly repeat it a little so that everybody clear, uh, gets it clearly. The first a uh, category in any society is a group called apathetics, A-P-A-T-H-E-T-I-C-S. What's the meaning of the, of the word apathy? Apathy means indifferent, indifference. Who are apathetics? Apathetics are people who are not really concerned about what is happening in the rest of the world. Okay. Now, apathy may come because of a variety of reasons. What are the reasons? One reason may be I may not be informed, I may not be knowledgeable, I may be somebody who is very oppressed and therefore I have not had the capacity to learn, to question. So indifference is something, so a lot of us in the political process are often uh, indifferent to uh, what is happening. So my question is, apathetics is not a general category. Okay. All of us are indifferent to certain things which happen in our society. If you talk to somebody like P. Sainath, P. Sainath has been a journalist who has been covering uh, rural affairs, agriculture, and especially he's done a lot of work on farmer suicide. And he says that if you look at between 1993, when a large number of farmer suicide uh, starts taking place in 2004, which was in some way a climax for in that uh, decade uh, plus, there were hardly any journalists covering farmer suicides. 
So most of us, if you look at the number of farmer suicides in the last uh, three decades, nearly three decades, it is uh, many lakhs. So therefore, in terms of a lot of us are not familiar because we don't, uh, we don't know, we don't read, or what we read doesn't cover. So we may be indifferent about a certain issue like agriculture districts. Or we may be indifferent about economic policy because it's something which you're not familiar with, you've not had a nobody has taught us, and therefore we avoid what is not familiar. Okay. We may also be indifferent about the political process because we believe the political process, we have our own uh, biases against the political process. We think it is manipulative, it's corrupt, uh, and therefore it is not for people like us. And therefore we choose to be indifferent. But also, we can also choose to be indifferent because our ways of thinking has not really uh, exposed us to certain possibilities. Let me give an example. Today my topic is cyclones. Okay. So in the cyclones and floods, okay, what are the ways in which people can protect themselves? Okay. Now, okay, there may be many ways. But if you also look at statistics in countries like Bangladesh, in many other countries, when floods and cyclones hit a place, in many areas, the number of women who die are more than the number of men who die. One of the reasons is that men sometimes have, especially in rural areas, have better survival strategies. But what are the survival strategies? If you look at the percentage of women who can swim and the percentage of men who can swim float, the percentage of men is higher because a lot of uh, women, especially in small towns, rural areas, etc., uh, it's not uh, seen as something which is necessary for a girl to know. Okay? But most men have to, uh, uh, most young boys uh, learn to swim in the river well, so the number of people who want to swim is much higher. Similarly, a lot of men escape because they know how to climb trees. For women, climbing trees is unfeminine. It's not in great. And even if a girl, young girl, she's called a tomboy, and as soon as she grows up, it is discouraged. So in terms of our understanding of issues which confront people, okay, we may be indifferent because our understanding of these issues is limited. But in a political process, the larger the number of people are indifferent to a variety of issues, the lesser will be the political participation. The lesser will be political engagement. So we will need to figure out how to reduce indifference. Second, there is nothing like a general category of indifference. If an issue affects us, we will engage with the political process. Those of you who are in Mumbai, I don't know if you remember, about two years ago, a lot of farmers came to Mumbai to Azad Maidan to protest against various laws, including the Land, uh, uh, sorry, the Forest Dwellers Act. Okay. And they're very sensitive to the needs of students, so therefore they walk through the night so that roads are not clogged. But large numbers of people came to protest and wanted to talk with the uh, chief minister and things like that. So therefore, so normally when you say rural people, masters are indifferent, they're not. If something affects them, they would definitely rise up. So if you look at a lot of people's movements, whether it is for rivers, forests, or whatever, if it affects their interests directly, and somebody can channelize their concern, they will definitely engage in the political process. But for us as students and young people, it's important uh, for us to have a better understanding of issues around us. Uh, so if we can continue to learn and reduce that ignorance about a lot of things, it will help. The second category of people are what are called spectators. Who are spectators? Spectators are people who know what's happening, who possibly discuss in canteens, dining rooms, uh, uh, if you go to places like Pune, there's something called a uh, katta where you people sit and discuss. 
um, if you go to Calcutta, there's a word called Adda. Adda, the meaning means, uh, colloquial Bengali, it means idle chatter. So you can sit and discuss about evolution, you can sit and discuss about uh, injustice, but one will not actually take a step to engage with the system. So a lot of us, especially the middle class, okay, are often spectators. Why do you call them spectators? If you look at voting percentage, if you look at a city like Mumbai, okay, some of the areas like uh, South Mumbai, Kulaba, Malabar Hill, okay, have extremely low uh, voting percentages. Okay. Uh, very low engagement in protests, or uh, you know, taking a public stand. So a lot of people tend to be, it's easy to be spectators. We know we can complain, uh, we can be very nasty about uh, politics and everything, but we will not uh, step in and engage. Okay? Sometimes we are spectators because we are also scared. We are scared of consequences. Maybe we have not uh, taken the step to empower ourselves. So that's the process. So that is something which we can correct. So a lot of well-informed people also do not engage enough. So what do I mean by engage? We can start if each one of us writes for a corporator, MLA, okay, ward officer, about issues. They're not confronting. They're saying, so this is a problem. Can we find a solution? It can start with that. If I increase the level of awareness in terms of multiple dimensions of a problem, so it will facilitate us to move from spectators to people who participate. Uh, I was talking about percentage. If you remember, there was uh, in 2008, in number 2008, there were terrorist attacks okay, on multiple places. There was a lot of anger. I don't know how young were you at that time, but a lot of people, I'm sure that some of you would have participated in uh, marches at uh, uh, Gateway and other places. Okay. That happened in November. Elections were due in uh, 2009 May. A lot of people said that this time we'll all register our protests and hold the government accountable for not handling the problem correctly. And therefore, uh, everybody hoped that there will be a lot of change and a lot of journalists started writing that this time their participation will be better. But once the election happened, the participation was not better. In some cases, it was even poorer. So sometimes a lot of anger against the system okay, is momentary because we are seeing something and we are responding. It doesn't continue translate into action. The third category is what we call gladiators. Gladiators are people who fight for issues and causes. I'm not saying all of us are called upon to fight uh, aggressively or actively or get involved in mortars. But there are different ways in which we can okay, uh, participate, we can uh, engage. If you look at a lot of educational institutions, educational institutions are also spectators. Most educational institutions don't take a stand on issues which are contentious. One college for me stood out, which had a lot of courage under a particular principle was St. Xavier's College. I don't know now, I haven't seen much of that. But remember when, when, Doc, when Dr. Fraser was a principal, okay? he was principal, I think, until 2016, uh, 15 or 16. When Dr. Fraser was a principal, I remember when, the, uh, when there was this case of uh, a super, I mean, a local court judgment against uh, uh, a doctor activist in Chhattisgarh, deny extent. Since College was the only college that's on his uh, website, they said, uh, uh, we condemn the uh, uh, arrest and harassment of, the, of uh, Dr. Benayak said, and uh, we support uh, Dr. Benayak said. Okay. I remember in Wilson College, two years, three years, four years ago, uh, we, did, uh, we, uh, we wanted to invite Benayak said, and the college was a little worried and they didn't want the controversy, they didn't allow us. So a lot of colleges also play safe. Uh, and I'm very happy that uh, this year's batch of political friends association uh, on social media takes a stand on a lot of political issues. 
and I hope uh, that trend continues because that's very important that as young people, as institutions, we must begin to empower ourselves, to take a stand. So therefore, when we're talking about uh, any political issue, ask ourselves, uh, when I am uh, a spectator, I expect other people to do something about it. Uh, when I am an apathetic, that is, I'm indifferent, it's also not my concern. My world is, uh, has other things which are priority. Sometimes, cynicism, okay? What is cynicism? The belief that nothing will ever get better. I don't hear it much, but uh, a few years ago, a lot of people, I mean, not a lot, some people used to say, is desh ka kuch nahi hoga. But that's very cynical, the belief that to uh, uh, believe that there is no hope. Uh, one young lady uh, forwarded a chapter from a book, and there's a category of people called uh, uh, misanthropes. Now, misanthropes believe that uh, human beings okay, uh, are useless, they can never become better, they can never be expected to behave in a better way. They're complete donkey, they're self centered, they're brutal, and nothing will change. Okay. And that could be one reason why we choose not to engage with the process. Okay. I believe that all of us, in small ways, can and must engage with the process. Choose, I mean, nobody can judge what should be the way we participate. There's a word called political efficacy. What is political efficacy? Political efficacy is uh, the extent of political participation. And that is a range. So it starts with awareness, uh, involvement. There are many categories. And the last is, of course, voting. But if we can increase our political efficacy, it helps. Uh, Sorry if I have digressed a little, but this is for something which is very important for me to establish. And I'm going to, uh, it's, it's going to be very important when we discuss the, uh, the topic of democracy, okay? uh, because this is a part of the process. Now, let us look at cyclones before I talk a lot about cyclones and causes and things like that. Uh, what is the number of trees uh, which have been um, uh, brought down by uh, cyclone Nisarga. Uh, they say up to about four or four to five lakh trees have fallen. Okay. And in a lot of places, the trees which have fallen are mango, coconut, jackfruit, uh, cashew. Okay. Now, in terms of uh, uh, what do you think is the earning? from a single uh, coconut tree per year. A coconut tree per year, the earning can anywhere between 550, uh, 500 to 2,500 rupees per tree. Okay. Uh, and in a single year, uh, you could have uh, from about 50 to about 100 coconuts. And if you sell it for uh, Narayal Pani, you maybe get better returns. If you look at mangoes, if you look at Alfonso and things like that, the earning per tree okay, can be up to 30,000. Okay. So, and to grow a tree, for it to start fruiting, so if you look at mango now, maybe within three to five years it can start fruiting. Uh, coconut takes six to eight years. So if a tree is uprooted, and they say that 80 to 90 percent of trees can't be replanted because they've been damaged because of the violence of the way in which it is uprooted. Look at the loss. It's not just about loss this year. Compared to floods and uh, things which, you know, destroy crops, crop damage is only for one year because you can then remove the silt and then you can have crop next year. But if you look at trees, uh, so if you say five lakh trees, and if you say a lot of them are fruit trees, what's the kind of you know uh, uh, 
consequence in terms of livelihoods. And if you look at the uh, uh, National Disaster Risk Management, how do they, how much do they pay per tree? They'll pay you, if, if your claims are properly filed, they pay you 180 rupees per tree. Now, if your income from a tree is in thousands, what percentage is 180 rupees? Second, uh, the Indian Army, uh, also for mangoes and things like that, it used to pay uh, about 15,000 rupees a hectare. This year, at least they're requesting, the Maharashtra government uh, is requesting to increase to 50,000. But even then, if a single tree can give you 25 to 30,000 or more, in hectare, how, many, how much will be your earning? Again, you know, what is the contribution just for mangoes uh, in terms of revenue generated? Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's about 3,500 to, uh, 3, to 4,000 crores. And uh, about 60 to 80% of the produce comes from, uh, in Maharashtra, it comes from the Konkan region. So, if you look at uh, something like a cyclone, can you imagine the kind of devastation okay, uh, it has visited? And policy makers, and we, I mean, none of us uh, uh, have a clue. I remember in terms of when there was a TV interview, people asked, oh, how many trees are. See, if a tree falls in Mumbai, it can damage cars, but the, the tree itself, loss of that tree, is not much of economic loss. I don't know if you, how many of you have heard of a cyclone called Cyclone Gaja in 2018. You know, in Cyclone Gaja, Cyclone Gaja, they say possibly was uh, the economic consequence of Cyclone Gaja was uh, equal to that of tsunami, okay? more than 13,000 crores. You know, we are talking about coconut trees, etc. One estimate is that 40 lakh coconut trees were brought down by Gaja. We're not looking at other trees, we're just looking at coconut trees. Because in India, Tamil Nadu okay, is the largest producer of coconuts. Though, of course, uh, uh, the word coconut, I mean, Kerala uh, is the land of coconuts, but in terms of output. So, Gaja, which uh, came to the Bay of Bengal, so look at the kind of impact. And also, if you're looking at, and, and so if you look at coconuts, you also look at uh, uh, toddy palms, okay. uh, targola, those trees, those trees are also on the coast, they fall, they're also a huge source of revenue. Because if you look at uh, uh, the targola, you know, right from the fruit uh, to the sap and to the uh, young, uh, you know, saplings, uh, in, in Tamil they call it Panakaran. It's all, you know, source of revenue. So in terms of if a cyclone or anything hits, the kind of economic damage in some parts of the country can be much more than others. So if you look at West Bengal, Urissa, yes, it affects fields and all of that. But in places where your revenue comes from horticulture, the consequences is far-reaching. Now that's something. Again, if you look at a tree like jackfruit, they say jackfruit is among the most uh, remunerated trees. The kind of revenue we can learn from jackfruit is possibly more than most other trees. So these are some things which I want us to look at. So when you look at cyclones, don't just, just go by loss of life or loss of property. Of course, there's a lot of damage to loss of property. Also, when you talk about Nisarga, what's the, I mean, the, when did Nisarga happen? Maybe about maybe 10, 12 years ago. Even today, in places like Velas and Jarle, these are villages, uh, there is no electricity. Transformers have fallen, poles have fallen. A lot of houses, the roofs have just gone because uh, the wind was about uh, uh, 120 kilometers uh, an hour. And therefore, that is uh, something which damage is extensive. And if you look at a cyclone which affected the east some time back, 
it was like an amphan amphan was what is called a super cyclone so when it hit odisha and uh, west bengal the the uh, speed of the winds was about 240 kilometers okay so you can therefore imagine the extent of damage so you talk about cyclones i want to you to understand that a lot of times even when you say preparedness there are certain things which what how can you really prepare against uh a cyclone with speeds like that which will knock down lots of trees so therefore that is uh, something which i don't know whether we've had conversation i have not had seen this conversation on on most media about the kind of you know damage and the kind of recovery uh, uh it takes okay so that is one uh thing similarly if you look at again uh, places like uh, uh the uh, to go for the tiger you know cashew is an important crop okay uh, beetle nut so all this big cropping so we will need to assess in terms of what is the kind of damage which could have taken place uh the other thing is if you look at the frequency of cyclones okay 2018 uh there were uh eight major cyclones uh which hit or which touched parts of india 2019 there were eight what's also concern is that a lot of the cyclones have been on the east coast but since 2019 there also the incidence of cyclones in uh the west coast especially the arabian sea has also uh, increased drastically and therefore that is uh, something which we need to look at of course as i said bombay got very lucky uh, we didn't really uh, suffer any kind of damage but the number of cyclones in the arabian sea uh, was almost equal to that of the number of cyclones in the uh, india i mean in the eastern side uh, or in the bay of bengal so that's something which we need uh, to understand also uh, when you talk about why is this uh, increase in cyclones it has a lot to do with climate change uh, it has a lot to do with uh, the indian ocean and of course i'm sure those of you who have studied uh, about global warming you are you are familiar with uh, el nino and so many of you are so the, it is these uh, you know warm water currents okay uh, which start off the coast of uh, brazil or south america and uh, they since the oceans are interconnected they affect and therefore that uh, causes a lot of changes can cause droughts or excessive rainfall along with el nino there's something which we need to be concerned which is specifically happening because of global warming there is something called please uh, look up after my session is something called indian ocean dipole some of you may be familiar indian ocean dipole d i p o l e what does it mean that is if you look at uh, the uh, eastern side of the uh, indian ocean uh, touching the pacific and the western side so when uh uh the uh, the uh, uh ocean currents become colder in uh, the eastern side of the indian ocean on the western side it will get warmer when it gets warmer there's a lot more precipitation okay. there will be a lot of rain and all of that now why is this uh, dipole increasing because what's happening in the pacific is there's a lot of uh, melting ice in the arctic the arctic shelf not as the iceberg but the arctic shelf is also melting and a lot of cold water from the pacific is also entering the indian ocean and therefore when the water when the uh, uh, air cools it becomes where the uh, uh, moisture is something which uh, is uh, it, it does not go up and therefore there's not much rainfall so one consequence of what we saw in australia last uh, Yeah, the huge wildfires because of excessive heat. On the other hand, there's a lot of rainfall in uh, Africa and in uh, West Asia. Okay, so therefore, there have been uh, rains in places which have never experienced rain. So if you look at places uh, like uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia there is one region. I forget the name. 
which has never seen uh, rains, and therefore they've been heavy rains. Now, what is the problem with this? One is, of course, there's a lot of damage in Africa, but when it rains in places where there is no moisture, it leads to a lot of locust attacks. The desert locust okay, can survive in its nymph form for years. It doesn't get active. But if there is sudden moisture concern there, I mean, the locusts are related to grasshoppers, they can be solitary. But when there's a lot of moisture and there's a lot of food, their numbers can increase. And the amount they can consume is huge. So in the last two years, we've seen a lot of locust swarms coming in Africa, Northern Africa, uh, Northeastern Africa, West Asia, and this year, parts of India. Last year also, some parts of India, Rajasthan and other places. So, if you look at uh, cyclones and locusts, all of us have to start looking at what, we call, what I call the big picture. What's the big picture? We need to put pressure on governments across the world to do something about climate change. Recently, uh, there's an article in terms of people are believing that in terms of the climate change impact has going to be more because till recently, we did not really look at clouds and their ability to impact okay, uh, climate. Okay. Uh, so therefore, that is something the, the modeling is still happening. Uh, so therefore, uh, scientists are still wary about what they're talking about. It. But this is something so important. So if I have to contribute to uh, reducing climate change, can increase carbon sink. That means um, uh, ensure that forests don't get destroyed, can we do a lot of tree planting? Some of those are things which we will need to look at. Um, also, when you talk about cyclones, uh, also uh, a lot of times um, there are shelters which are not differentiated, a lot of things, but there is a separate thing on disaster management, I'll talk about it then. So therefore, this is something about cyclone and in terms of the larger, uh, what I call the bigger picture. Uh, is there anything I need to look at? Um, okay. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read uh, a book, uh, a non-fiction book by Amitabh Ghosh uh, called The Great Derangement. Okay. I want you to see if you can read the book. The Great Derangement by Amitabh Ghosh. So, he talks about uh, uh, literature, history, and politics, okay, and the lack of engagement with the uh, social political process, with the political process and policy and climate change. They're not really taken seriously. Uh, I like the book also because uh, it talks about uh, a particular cyclone which is supposed to hit uh, Bombay in 1944. Okay. And on Google, if you check that, it talks about a lot of loss of life. And one of his friends was an academic in the U.S., warned him and said, there's some problem with the data, please cross-check. So in spite of what Google said, uh, he decided to look at archives. And when he checked the archives, there was only one newspaper in uh, Bombay, Samacha, which had covered it, and there was no loss of life. But if you Google it, look at the information of what it talks about, the cyclone which hit Bombay in 1944, where a lot of trees also fell. So sometimes you'll need to figure out better ways to get information. Uh, I think I've crossed my time for speaking. Uh, now I'll take up question answers if there's anything else uh, which needs to be added. Uh, sorry, uh, before I open up questions, two other things. But sometimes, even as environmentalists, we need to, uh, sorry, I'm not an environmentalist, but I'm saying even as people are concerned about the environment, we need to be careful about not changing so much about the ecosystem. What do I mean by that? If you go to Ladakh, Ladakh is a cold desert. Vegetation is very sparse in many places. But in the last 20 years, a lot of people have planted trees, plantation of apricot, poplar. So you find a lot of green patches near villages as you travel across Ladakh. So therefore what is happening is there is a lot more uh, transpiration, moisture is increasing. 
And a few years ago, there was a cloud burst in Ladakh, okay, which caused a lot of destruction of property. Now, what is the problem in Ladakh? Okay. Most of the houses of Ladakh are mud houses. They're not baked bricks, etc. They're not mortar, they're not cement. And therefore, if there are, if climate is changing and there's going to be precipitation till they can transform to, and, and also the best part about mud houses was that every part of, a, if I wanted to build a new house, I would demolish, I would use the same mud to build a new house and little more material. So it was uh, a very sustainable society. So when you tamper with ecosystems, okay, maybe it may have positive implications, but the consequences can also be uh, uh, major. So I want to think about it, find out more about it. The other part is floods. Floods are a recurrent feature. And in some ways, we still don't know how to deal with floods. A lot of the time, the dams we build sometimes, you know, uh, are not so really useful. Are there better ways of managing floods? Okay. Uh, so therefore, we will look at when you do disaster. We'll have to look at, but we need to look at the incidence of floods are going to increase. Okay. So are we better prepared? Are we doing something to mitigate that? Because that will be uh, important for us to look at. So I'll stop here. i just this is just a seed. I've not discussed much. Uh, let us look at questions. Okay, it's about uh, 7.15, so therefore uh, uh, we should have time for questions. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have a question here by Parikshit Dokwal. Yeah. While I quoted about economists saying that new normal won't be similar to the new normal in terms of environmental impact post-corona, how do one disintegrate between a natural disaster and climate change caused by human invasion? For example, disasters like cyclone and natural phenomenon, which gets intensified by human action, or we consider disasters are the result of just climate change. So what, that's what I'm saying. So we need to find out solutions. As I said, I'm constantly saying all of us can look at solutions. Second, are we put, putting enough pressure on policymakers? Do we know about the kind of, you know, what is the Paris Agreement on climate change? A lot of people feel it's inadequate. Okay. Uh, you know, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, uh, a small country called Vanatu. Vanatu is a, a couple of, is a collection of islands in the Pacific. Okay. They're one of the few people who are very angry with the fact that the rest of the world is not doing enough about climate change. Because many of the islands are already going underwater as uh, the sea rises. So we need to have some kind of urgency okay, in terms of putting pressure, uh, taking corrective measures. Uh, can some of you, our physics students, others, find cleaner ways of generating electricity? Okay. What are the ways in which we can do? Now, you know, um, uh, last year, a lot of alumni of Wilson College came together and they have collected more than 15 lakhs, and the whole college shifted to LED. Okay. And uh, the savings in electricity is about, is, uh, is, I mean, the, is 30%, okay. which is huge. Similarly, some of your ex-students can get together, uh, get some vendors, if you can use some of our roofs uh, for, to do solar. And if you can get a lot of buildings in Mumbai uh, to, from the solar, connect to the grid, figure out how. And so we need to have solutions which, uh, you know, which need to be faster. Of course, some people are saying uh, the time for doing anything positive has gone. I don't believe such negative uh, thing. There's always time to do something uh, very drastic. I don't know how many of you are familiar with something called the Montreal Protocol. The Montreal Protocol in 1986 was a collective agreement by countries of the world to phase out CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, okay, so that the damage to the ozone hole could be reduced and we could take care of that. Okay. So there is example of collective action. So to, be, to become pessimistic and say that nothing will happen, I think is unfortunate. 
Yeah. I hope I answered the question. Parth asks, in recent incidents such as the murder of George Floyd or the death of Shushan Singh Rajput have got everyone onto their social media. This has also brought up criticism towards virtue signaling. What are you? What are your views on virtue signaling, and where would you categorize such people as apathetic spectators or gladiators? But one important thing is yes, uh, a lot of us uh, feel angry, but we should also feel angry about a lot of other things. Second, uh, I just want to do a little bit of uh, a digression and come back. Uh, how many of you are familiar, it was 2010, 11, when uh, Anna Hazare uh, had this massive protest at Ramila ground uh, for Lokpal. Okay. And uh, uh, so there were a lot of people and a lot of pressure. Then Anna Hazare said uh, he will uh, shift to Mumbai. Okay. He said, okay, and they said, okay, people booked uh, the Bandar Kurla complex. And uh, more than a million people online said we will join. Okay. When the actual event happened, okay, the number was 5,000 or less. So a lot of people who did signaling on social media that they supported and they wanted to be a part of the movement did not follow it up okay, with actual steps. So when you're talking about this uh, thing, social media allows you sometimes to seem like a gladiator when you're just a spectator. Okay. So because unless you, okay, so if you're talking about uh, the, what's happening, the race issue, does it also translate into anger against uh, atrocities of Dalits in India? Dalits of women, I mean, uh, atrocities on women, okay. especially when uh, the state is responsible. You can say, well, whatever else people say, why is that uh, Floyd George thing so important? Because it was the state is supposed to protect individuals who are responsible for the death of an individual. So I don't know. Maybe you should ask your uh, parents and grandparents in 1982 when there was this Mathura incident. A girl called Mathura was gang raped at a police station. I remember most people like in India at that time did not even know about it. I'm sure if, you know, when something which gets published, a lot of us will react. But what are we doing in terms of putting pressure on the government to make the world safer for women, the world safer for Dalits, the world safer for minorities, the world safer for anybody? So, for me, social media sometimes can also be a cop out because. It can be anonymous, it can mean places which is, you know, uh, where it can be part of a cloud. But we also have to find other ways in which we uh, uh, express our stand. Okay. Uh, more directly, as I said, send letters, send petitions. There are a lot of things we could do. I hope that answers. Uh, so, have you turned off your video? Because, yeah. Okay, yeah. the next question is, yeah, it's fine now. The next okay. question is by Anvesha. In terms of cyclone, as they have ability to cause such huge loss, do we have dedicated funds at state level and with centers so that there won't be shortage when they happen and help can be provided immediately? If yes, are they at least good enough? What is your view on this particular infrastructure to ensure economic preparedness at least? See, the, uh, the National Disaster Management Authority was set up in 2005. Uh, in states like uh, Orissa, uh, the disaster management uh, is much better in terms of the ability to uh, the early warning system and evacuation has uh, drastically reduced uh, the loss of human life. Okay. But given our uh, density of population and livelihoods near the coast, uh, whether that can be completely eliminated, the economic losses will be there. But uh, economic losses also not realistically uh, what should I say? Calculated. In the beginning of the lecture, I talked about them. If you're giving 180 rupees for a tree which has fallen down and it's a mango tree, okay, it's like rubbing salt on one's wound. Forget the loss from this year, but what about uh, 
the next five or six years. So all of that, so therefore, in terms of understanding, as I said, a lot of the uh, people are making policy possible to understand the impact of cyclones in areas where horticulture is a major source of uh, revenue. I think that will happen. Of course, there are, there are funds, uh, whether they reach, whether they're adequate. Because even if you look at how much has the central government promised the West Bengal government, okay, 3,000 crores, what's the damage? 30,000 crore plus. So there's a huge gap. And do state governments have the money? No. If you look at the way the revenue is distributed, uh, many state governments depend up to 80% of their uh, financial needs from the center. Because in the distribution income, GSA, a lot of it is taken by the center and then shared with the states. And with the coming of uh, uh, GST, states have lost a lot of the opt and all the local taxes have, been, have gone. Uh, so therefore, the states have much lesser access to revenue. Okay, when I say my, I'm not talking about say in Maharashtra, okay, it's financially much more vibrant, but a lot of other states have very, very little access to a uh, lot of revenue. So therefore, that is, uh, uh, it's a serious uh, concern. I don't think they've adequately uh, dealt with. Yeah. Omkar, please ask your question. Good evening, sir. Yes, good evening, sir. Uh, sir, sir, in the initial part of your talk, you know, you spoke of indifference. Yeah. So we see this indifference, you know, especially in a multicultural and this so-called diverse society like ours, where we are moved by issues only which affect our set of ideas or maybe the roots from which we belong. So this, to a certain extent, I believe, you know, is a potential cause of increased differences and hatred in our country. I mean, one speaking for only the issues which suits to his own ideas or maybe his own, his own culture or roots, it creates some sort of uh, hatred or maybe, you know, some arrogance in the opposite party and this goes always in our society. So how do we find a common thread in this, you know, which would help us pick up for all the issues equally, irrespective of our preconceived notions or for that matter the set of beliefs or roots which we hold? Okay. Yeah, first two things. One is I don't fully agree with your statement, that is because of differences. Uh, in my second lecture, I talked about this guy, Suraj Yangde. Uh, so, Suraj Yangde says that a lot of the better of Dalits, uh, uh, aspirational Dalits, sometimes are not really concerned about what happens to uh, the poorer, marginalized Dalits. Okay? Uh, they don't take a stand, they don't put pressure, they don't even identify with them. So, that's true across communities because uh, even within a certain religious group, uh, you will not find uh, everybody supporting our, uh, you know, uh, people uh, across, therefore, uh, across regions. You know, what happens to Muslims in Kashmir in terms of uh, how much will the kind of support be from Muslims in the rest of India? I don't know how much of evidence there is to support that. Or in terms of any other community, there will be some, but it's not uh, there. The second part in the multicultural society, Basically, if all of us believe we are human beings uh, who need to connect with each other, then we need to start doing something about the kind of hatred, uh, the kind of distrust, uh, the kind of, uh, all of that has built up. So we need to find how do we build bridges. Building bridges is an activity which has, happened, has to happen from both sides. All communities have to extend, all of us have to extend. We need to find out the roots of our own hatred. But uh, the uh, indifference also, uh, people are different from us economically, different from us socially, even within our own community, even within our own religious group. Sometimes you may not be bothered. That's why I said, so let us look at this uh, lecture on cyclones in terms of how many of us sitting in Mumbai really know a concern about what's happening in uh, Raigad district, uh, parts of Raigad district and uh, Ratnagiri, which has been badly affected by uh, cyclones. A lot of us are not. So, indifference is not only because uh, the other is suffering, also because uh, we create our own small circles of uh, privilege, uh, of comfort. Okay, that will also have to be dealt with. So, it is both what, what you say is partially true. We need to find ways in uh, building 
uh, common humanity, which is very, very important. Uh, so we need to find, uh, build bridges. Uh, so after the communal riots in 1993, I remember in Dharavi, they created a lot of Mohalla committees. And many of them said for the first time they talked to the people from the other communities. Or if you look at South Africa, I mean, I don't know how we can replicate that. South Africa after the uh, apartheid, where the uh, people of European descent had brutalized uh, Native Africans. Okay, so when, when the uh, majority uh, came into power, one of the first things they said is we must find ways in which we don't carry bitterness and anger. And we acknowledge and uh, forgive each other for what has happened in the past. So please read about the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, the various kind of cases. Uh, it was headed by somebody who won the Nobel Prize for Peace much earlier, called Bishop uh, Desmond Tutu. Look at that. There are examples for us to learn from, within the country, outside the country. Okay. Yes, Thank you. Rahul, please ask your question. Uh, Rahul, are you there? May I audible? Uh, yes. I, you hello. Yeah. Yes. Good evening, sir. Uh, yes. Yeah. Sir, I want to ask you a question. Uh, first, uh, first question is, sir, uh, I had attended uh, 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 a session in which the speaker argued, and that is very valid, valid argued, that uh, uh, Indian education system is only tested our memory. Uh, so one of the girl argue in that session, can we change this system through petitions? So uh, the speaker said, let's uh, let's check how much time it get to change through your petitions. So go and and uh, uh, file the petition and just wait how much time it gets uh, to change this system through petitions. So basically, he, I guess, he discourages this girl to change this system through petitions. So he, she, sorry, she asks, so what is the other way to change this system? So, so he not saying that, but essence of his uh, answer is accommodate uh, in this uh, education system. Let's accommodate in this education system as it is. So, sir, my question is, first question is, uh, this kind of argument, let's wait how much it will take for change. It is, it, it's create hindrance for uh, engaging political, uh, uh, political system. It is also, not, do you think it is not also discourages the girl who, want, who wants to change the system through petitions and that is the right way? Okay. Let me answer the question in two ways. One, uh, petitions for public education, maybe the girls who start uh, talking to lawyers, uh, figure out whether we can do something about it, whether the court will take up, we'll need to wait. But as I said, it's, petition is just one way. What are the other ways? If students want, they can put pressure on the university and the government. If you remember, I talked about the 1968 uh, student revolution, uh, which uh, uh, brought, I mean, it forced the government to change a lot of things. Ten years after that, I told in Mumbai University, and Mumbai University said, you'll have two papers of foundation course in each year. Uh, all the students protested, uh, we were not allowed to enter college for two weeks. And uh, then the government said, okay, you'll have only one. Okay. If you look at uh, situations where uh, fee rise, okay, a lot of people protest and ensure that fee rise doesn't happen. So to say that uh, we can't change is not true. The answer is how do you find ways in mobilizing large numbers of people? Okay. That is one part of the second part of the answer is, see, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with uh, this kind of generalization that our education is only a memory. Because in a lot of our classrooms in college places across India, there are conversations, there are discussions. Okay. And there is a lot of space within constraints to learn differently. Okay. And a lot of people, and, and, and if you look at uh, people who go from India and study in universities across the world, they're all doing well. 
That means something about a system has provided them the necessary kind of foundation where they are able to thrive elsewhere. Of course, there are lacunae. But to completely say that this is, uh, doesn't work at all uh, is something which again is saying that, you know, I think we are being too negative. I agree there are a lot of problems. And we all need to find solutions. And I'm sure we can find solutions. But the important thing is a lot more people have to engage and we have to try multiple ways. You know, many years ago there was an organization called BEAG, Bombay Environmental Action Group. So they would uh, do uh, mobilization. They will also file uh, PIL. So many things can go together. So I don't think uh, that we should be pessimistic. True, many times PILs don't make headway, uh, judges have not been sympathetic. So we need to figure out how do we, and maybe at different places people find PIL. So there are lots of things which we can explore. Okay. I, possibly, I, I personally believe that there is a lot which we can do. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so my second question is, yeah, yeah, I have a second question. Uh, my second take up your second question later because uh, we have a lot of other questions. So we'll take it up towards the, once we are done taking yeah. other questions. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, so Mahmood K asks, can we attribute COVID-19 as one of the consequences of climate change? Uh, I don't know. Because I'm not sure. Because see, this we have to look at this uh, uh, a lot more scientific evidence. Uh, it's possible it's come from wet markets, and uh, a lot of epidemics have, like whether it is the HIV or whatever else, also happen because of uh, uh, the boundary between the wild and domestic changed. Uh, a lot of people began consuming animal things which earlier were not outside. And because of that, we didn't, didn't have defenses. Okay. So that, there could be many reasons. But some of these will possibly get aggravated maybe because of climate change. But also we must ask questions in terms of as uh, human beings in different parts of the world, is our immunity is actually reducing? Okay. Are we neglecting uh, immune systems? What are the stresses? So this is, again, there could be multiple reasons. And for us to find out whether it's only climate change, what will take? a little more time for us to collect data and study. So I don't know whether we can attribute it to one particular uh, cause. Yeah. So Bin Joseph asks, as you have mentioned, using natural resources to provide electricity, which is environmental friendly. Don't you think nuclear energy can also be a safer way of providing electricity, just like how France is doing it? Okay, see, uh, France, of course, I'm uh, glad you asked the question because France gets 75 to 80 percent of its thing from this. But the initial cost is very high. Uh, there are also issues with disposal waste. There are a lot of issues in terms of. See, in India, we have had a nuclear program. Uh, first nuclear power plant came up in 72. And uh, though in 2007 uh, we have signed uh, uh, the nuclear deal with US, and we're still figuring out how to ensure that we can speed it up. Other than France, most other countries have not taken up. So we need to find out what are the reasons why the other countries have not taken up. Uh, in Japan, which is also moving from 25 to 40 percent, uh, it slowed down after Fukushima. But Fukushima was an, was an accident because uh, the backup system tripped because of the water getting into the system. Uh, so we need to fully understand that. So, but again, what are the uh, problems of radiation, a lot of that, we need to, all this is not fully understood. What you say is true that in terms of energy generation, uh, nuclear energy is possibly extremely efficient than any, any other thing. But what are the other issues we will need to uh, look at pros and cons and take a call? But uh, in India, again, if you look at uh, some of you smart ones who know how many uh, nuclear reactors we have in India. So look at what is the output okay? and figure out why is it that we are not being able to do that. So maybe we can figure that out. Also, if you look at, you know, the Kurum Kurum protests, what are the issues raised? It is, it will be, okay, it will give us some more understanding of uh, issues on the ground. Uh, so I think we can explore that. I mean, uh, what you say in theory has a lot of sense, but also look at uh, what are the possible reasons which can come against it. Maybe we can look at that, definitely.
Manali Sharma, please ask your question. Am I audible? Yes. yes. So my question was uh, related to Amphan and uh, what I read post the cyclone. Um, when it hit the eastern coast, a lot of rivers, um, a lot of local rivers like uh, say Rupsha or Tashur or Shibshar, they um, uh, reached the, uh, I mean the flow reached the danger mark and they were overflowing. And um, a lot of banks and embankments which had been built uh, surrounding these rivers were broken uh, in areas like maybe Satkira. And uh, a lot of that seawater came into the land. And that led to a lot of um, imbalance because that, taking that water out uh, became a big concern. Um, the seaweeds uh, became a big concern. So when we speak of rehabilitation, we are mostly looking at um, human rehabilitation. So what happens to ecological rehabilitation in such cases? Because that is destroyed. And uh, what exactly, what and how much does the government pay attention to it? See, ecological priority is possibly among the lowest. That's one question, one answer. Second, when you're talking about this, uh, you know, when the rains and other things, also, what has happened is, see, earlier, uh, rivers used to have a certain amount of flow. But a lot of the rivers, there are a lot of dams which have been built. And as we, uh, we are still going through the dry season, in terms of the flow of water has reduced drastically because of this. And therefore, when there is, uh, the, the sea has been coming in, not just because of cycling, even before that in many more places. So the salinity is increasing in many places. If you look at what has happened, I mean, it would be very instructive for all of you to read about what has happened to Indus rivers. Okay. Entire community has been affected because of so many dams being built. The seawater has come in so much and destroyed so much of land. So we will need to look at the, uh, the long-term implications of so much of our actions and what kind of corrective things can we take. So therefore, I'm uh, very happy to raise this question because all of us will need to read up a lot more on this. Okay. And as far as ecological restoration, etc., I don't think governments have governments are only going to uh, respond to what they what is visible. If something is not visible in terms of it's obvious, they will not really respond to it. So all these are normally seen as less important. So the ecological restoration uh, and uh, uh, you know, extensive studies, a lot of it is not happening. Jovi Philip, please ask yeah. you. Uh, Jovi Philip, can we have you? Hello. Yeah, yes. Thank you, Shruti. Uh, okay, my question is uh, relating to what defines a national calamity and on what grounds does the government decide it's a national calamity or not? You know, uh, my question may be pertaining also to the fact that when, why, when Kerala was debating, that you know the Kerala floods be called a national calamity, whereas the government refused to, the national government refused to. See, basically, so, you say national calamity is in terms of the extent of damage caused by something, okay. uh, whether it's uh, beyond in terms of life, in terms of uh, uh, economic losses. If it's beyond a certain amount, it should be a national calamity. But the problem is anything extensive damage should be something which is a national calamity. But because uh, a lot of our definitions in India today are defined by politics and ideology. And that's the reason why uh, so many uh, instances uh, don't get seen as national calamity. Okay. Uh, you know, if you take of floods and whatever else, it's, it's also often a matter of convenience. So if you look at now, why is the government responding immediately to Odisha and uh, uh, Bengal? Because elections are coming up. And the central mm -hmm. government wants to be seen as being sympathetic. Because I remember in terms of the kind of money which came to Kerala after the Kerala floods was extremely paltry. So therefore, it is all often driven by political calculation. So we don't have really a definition of what's a national plan. It should be something we should, in terms of the extent of economic loss, uh, loss of human life, uh, dislocation, all of that we really need to look at. And how much time will it take to rebuild. So, all of, so that is something which we need to, but we don't really have 
uh, uh, one definition of what a national calamity is. Thank you. It's more a matter of convenience. Sorry. Uh, there's a question by Ajay Kumar Shukla. There is a concept called backyard environmentalism, which means people don't care about the climate change until it starts affecting their houses. So during the RA issue, the elite class of Mumbai started participating in the protest, but they never questioned the BMC when the city floods every year. So do you think that even elites were protesting because they realize now that it is affecting their lives, whereas Adivasi community of the RA are talking about the same for 30 to 40 years? Uh, no, I definitely understand this whole backyard thing. See, uh, this back backyard environmentalism comes from a place called Nimbi, not in my backyard, where people would protest against summer power plants or chemical plants if it is near them and therefore could affect them. They would not be bothered if it happened 200 mi miles away from them. So that is the problem, not just of the elites, but of all of us. If something is uh, a lot of destruction which can affect climate change, etc., is happening elsewhere. So now how many of us are really bothered about what's happening in Assam or Arunachal Pradesh in terms of forest clearances and all of that? We are not. So something in the city, something in terms of uh, uh, active on social media, a lot of us, not just the elites, will possibly will join in. Uh, I don't know if it's just backyard or in terms of something which uh, seems to catch our attention. Uh, and therefore we join. But this backyard environment is very true. Most of us only bother about things which happen uh, in areas which we think is ours. And so we are not really concerned about larger issues in any part of the country. That's why I also said we need to question our own practice. As I said, uh, whether it is uh, cheap planting, are we doing the right kind of work, are we worsening the situation. So, this kind of thinking, more kind of conversations are necessary. Yeah. Mustafa, please ask your question. Oh, hi, Tana. Yes. Yeah. Good evening, sir. So, since we briefly touched up on the George Floyd issue, my question is regarding that. Uh, my question is how much of how many of our communal problems and racism can be attributed to our past as hunters and gatherers because in the past uh, as tribalists we'd be wary of uh, people that weren't from our tribe or people that look different or communicated differently from us so do you think that flaw has carried forward with us in modern civilization and do you think it is something inherent to modern human beings and will it always plague us as a civilization or a society or can something be done about it because okay. if you look sorry yeah, sorry. please continue yeah no i was just going to say because if you think about it it's not it's not just something that is right now america is in in the spotlight it's something that can be seen in the smallest of villages as well as the biggest cities and it has been there i mean at least small or big form of communal problems have been there for the longest time. Yeah, so that's, that's just what I want to say. Yeah, see, when you talk about, uh, if you look at society, if, I don't know, if you look at societies like Switzerland, uh, which, are, which are multiple communities, if you look at a, a country like Lebanon, uh, they have strife, but they also have found ways to work together. Uh, if you look at communal issues, a lot of it have roots, uh, either in imperialism or in some kind of processes, which are fairly recent. Okay? When I say recent, maybe two, three hundred years. True, there is a lot of animal instinct in terms of, uh, okay, whether it is, uh, 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 like if you look at the human uh, mind itself, the amygdala, which is our primitive brain, often pushes us to do things. Uh, so therefore that is there, but I, I'm not sure that that can explain uh, the kind of, because in a lot of other societies, which also have, which have become largely multicultural, if you look at Canada, if you look at other places, uh, they have possibly learned to live together. And uh, maybe the incidents are less. So it also uh, depends on the kind of, uh, uh, you know, political will which people have. So if you look at a state like West Bengal, from uh, 1977 till 2014, 
uh, when the left front government was in power, there were hardly any communal riots. You can check this uh, cross check, the number of communal riots because the government had a stake in ensuring that there was harmony. But for some other people, uh, politically it, is, it suits you when you are able to uh, focus on the other. So, they, so the divisive politics can be practiced at many levels. And sometimes our conditioning can be can create a community. Because I don't think it's about us as uh, human nature. I'm not sure because, see that, see if you look at the time you have traveled and if you look at uh, a lot of communities that live together, um, you know, and found common solutions. So that's important. So if you look at a language like Urdu, Urdu was, is, is what is called the language of the camp. It has uh, about 40 to 50 percent Prakrit. It's many different languages which have come together to create a language because people wanted to find something which could connect. Uh, like if, if you look at India, you know, there's something called what we call a syncretic culture. What is syncretic? Maybe in many parts, people can still, you know, uh, find ways uh, to borrow from each other's traditions, culture, and otherwise. Uh, I don't know if you've been to Kashmir. If you ever go to Kashmir, uh, who is the patron saint of Kashmir? The patron saint of Kashmir is a person called Nuruddin. And he's also called Nandarishi. Uh, who was Nuruddin's uh, uh, spiritual mentor? His spiritual mentor was a Hindu mystic called Lal Dev. She was his mentor. And therefore, that tradition, of course, for various other reasons, there's radicalization, lots of things have gone wrong. But as human beings, we have found ways to live together, to do things together. I'm sure it's possible. Because even if you look at South Africa after the brutality, there's a lot more, uh, I mean, at least uh, truth and reconciliation worked quite some excellent. There are still problems. But I think it's possible to uh, find solutions. I mean, we have, we have found solutions in the past, and I'm sure we can. Uh, just a reminder for those who joined in late, uh, our sessions now begin at 6.30 p.m., not at 7, so please note that we are having our sessions at 6.30 p.m. Uh, there's a question by Pragya Jain. Yeah. Uh, I wish to understand the implications of increased cultivated land in the parts of Rajasthan. One clear implication that we see is the decrease in the number of number and severity of the sandstorms because of the increased green patches. This has disturbed the natural cooling system leading to increased extreme temperatures. Is this process of grieving the desert reversible and feasible given the increased drive towards going green, maintaining the ecosystem of the desert? Yeah, because see, in, in Rajasthan, at least for the past 100 years, we have, uh, you know, uh, found ways to make it green in terms of building canals. The Danda Canal is one of the oldest. So a lot of the kind of, that's why I'm saying, see, a lot of that kind of change uh, often also is, is changing uh, things in a, in, a, in a way which I think is a problem. I'll just uh, come to Rajasthan in some way. If you look at Tamil Nadu, okay, a lot of Tamil Nadu is in the rain shadow area. So therefore, a lot of the crops were, would be crops which didn't need so much of water. The moment dams in the Kaveri and the Kaveri rivers were diverted, people start going rice. Even if you look at Marathwara, Marathwara is uh, drought prone. But look at the amount of sugarcane which has been uh, planted uh, and in terms of because of Godavari and Krishna dams being built and diverted. So human tendency is to change. And that can affect the soil salinity, that is the air. There's, there's a lot of problems. But when you say, can we reverse this? I don't think it will be politically popular. Okay. Everybody wants uh, to uh, land to become more productive. Uh, we're not really looking at using traditional ways of, uh, of uh, conserving water. If we had done that, even without, we could have productivity without dams and increasing greenery. Uh, there is a book, uh, you can please take it down, called Dying Wisdom. It's a book published by Center for Science and Environment from Delhi. It's a fairly old book, in the sense, it's published in 1990, I think, uh, 1998. 
uh, I forget the year, that looks at traditional water harvesting systems. And it looks at, especially in Rajasthan, there's some amazing uh, water harvesting systems. That's what uh, this guy, Rajinder Singh, is doing. He's trying to revive rivers only using traditional water harvesting systems. So, and I said, even in Rajasthan, the problems of Marwar will be different from problem, problems of Mewar because traditionally the, the regions have been very different. So, yes, I mean, uh, this kind of uh, reversing, I don't think is politically feasible. Maybe other solutions you can look at. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Akash, please ask your question. Uh, yes, hello. Yes, uh, so, so my thing is, so there's a lot of talk about in clean energy, like solar panels is a, a solar plants are a massive uh, discussion as far as being one of the forerunners of clean energy. But the thing with uh, solar panels is because a first the cost of construction of such plants are very high, which includes also large amount of mining of silica and metal to create the panels. And also when you take up that amount of land, you are kind of uh, you're kind of negating the fall of rainfall on the soil, which also uh, leads to a lot of catchment area for the groundwater, especially when you grow solar panels in, uh, build solar panels in desert areas where groundwater is a very important part of the uh, existence. So, I mean, I mean, that's one of the things I found whenever I've been reading about this clean energy and solar panels, like it's a, like a very, like it's a bit of a paradox. Okay. Uh... Okay, what you say is very true about this whole question in many parts, not just in the desert, in many parts this huge uh, uh, solar panels are definitely uh, depriving the ground of uh, nutrients, water, uh, uh, vegetation, a lot of that is getting affected, that's true. But I'm looking at are they, can you find more, be more creative and reduce that, that's one. Uh, second, I, uh, please see, if all of you can read a book called Quest. It's by a guy called Yergin. Uh, it looks at all these solutions. And he also, I mean, and why I'm asking, because Akash asked this question, I want to go back to it. He says, a lot of us say, think that if you have electric cars, okay, carbon emissions will come down. So he says, where is the amount, kind of energy for electric cars going to come from every time you want to charge a car battery? Imagine the amount of electricity. Obviously, it has to be generated by a power plant of some kind, which will, you know, because uh, every night if uh, a thousand cars are going to uh, charge, you know, look at the kind of uh, impact. So, we have not understood this, uh, uh, these uh, interconnections. The second thing is, yeah, silica, are there better ways of tapping solar energy? Uh, how many of you are familiar with this guy called Bunker Roy? I think it's Bunker Roy. Please, uh, when you go home, please Google Barefoot College. Barefoot College started in Tulun, Rajasthan. A lot of people with local materials are creating a lot of solutions uh, which are energy efficient, whether it is in terms of solar lights or whatever. Please look at that. And that's why I said if all of us, if all communities can figure out creative solutions, I'm sure there are uh, ways in which it can be done. I think Bankaroy, if you name it, I mean, my memory for names is very bad. So if it's Bankara, look at his TED talk also, he gives us examples. There are solutions. See, uh, Akash, what we say about current, these huge solar power plants, there are lots of problems. Their efficiency levels are low, there are a lot of issues. But I'm sure technology and creative ways of doing it uh, could be, I mean, there could be solutions. Yeah. I hope that answers. Uh, Rahul Singh, you can ask your question. Rahul, are you there? Uh, okay. Um, Hello. Um, Hello. Yes, yes. Uh, May I ask? Yeah, please. Yeah. Thank you. Sir, yesterday I, I read a case study of Atharva Palli Dam. If I'm not uh, not uh, pronounced, uh, I wrongly. Uh, the first part of the question is uh, not audible. Atharva Palli Dam. It is in Kerala. It uh, it was a project in 1979, but due to agitations of uh, environmentalists and tribals, this project is not 
yet started and uh, similar cases we saw in uh, Ch chaitapur nuclear power plant and uh, are forest also whether where the people from and uh, agitate against government uh, ambitious economic project who destroy the environment do you feel sir this kind of agitation this kind of agitation uh, prevent government to destroy the uh, uh, environment at the cost of economic uh, economical benefit this kind this kind of agitation uh, are the protector of environment and play big role to yes sir okay uh let me answer first of all uh you're mixing up two or three different issues one uh when you look at uh, uh ra ra is not about uh, economic development ra is a uh, ancillary is you are building a car shed as i said environmentalists and activists in mumbai have never been against the metro project okay so that see so therefore we need to frame our understanding of issues a little more clearly that's one uh, second if you look at jaitapur jaitapur the problem is not from environmentalists the problem is from local farmers uh, fisher folk all of them because they feel their livelihoods will be destroyed because of radiation because of warm water uh, which will be released because from which are used to cool the uh, cars and all of that so all of that could affect their uh, livelihoods and also if you look at in terms of tribal communities etc see in many of these places all the activists have suggested alternatives so sometimes but uh, bureaucrats politicians others don't want to look at alternatives and also uh, please read there is this old book called uh, temples or tombs nehru used to call uh, big dams as uh, temples of modern india whether they've been able to achieve so a lot of ambitious programs uh, actually perform far below par so that we need to ask questions about that as well okay so therefore that is so the see if the issue is complex is not just see the environmental issues one but also local communities there are so many other issues which are connected to that and also when you build a dam as i said if you build a dam what will be the consequences like please do read the story of what happened to uh more than about 2 or 3 lakhs of people who live at the mouth of the indus river in pakistan okay the water flow so reduced that all their lands have become completely saline the sea has just come in so the uh, issues are very complex and there are multiple issues so therefore that we will need to uh understand all of that and then have a conversation because everything with government plans may not be in the best interest of uh people at large and it's not, i mean there are uh, uh, uh mining projects which are being opposed uh dam projects in jharkhand being opposed koyal karo and others so the issues are i think a little uh will need a little more understanding and it's not just about environment versus the other that's what that's what i've been saying from day two that it's not always environment versus the other we are saying can we have development which does not damage the environment so much so that we need to understand a little better because even if you look at the sustainable of the world is let's have sustainable development which is not uh deny future generations of access to resources benefits okay that's the issue uh so we have crossed the 1 hour 30 minute mark so and we have three to four questions pending do you want to take them today or yeah, we can take it up because otherwise so the more question okay. i finish today tomorrow's time is not taken you know the first okay. 10 minutes goes in question so i'll answer that then what is left i can take tomorrow yeah okay so zevia asks the city has less cover of mangroves how can one overcome solutions towards it the mangrove degradation has taken place because of construction and a lot of other things and mangrove planting is very difficult but more important is that Uh, a lot of builders and others have actually actively killed off mangroves and uh, so the for remaining patches is replanting mangroves is a very special skill it's not like tree planting else so therefore that's a thing so even if you just protect it uh, 
it'll possibly be generated. So if you go to Vikroli, the fact that a lot of the mango land is under, under a trust, and that part of mangroves is protected. Okay. So protection of mangroves is because, see, so like if you look at the entire Bandarkula complex, that is all mangroves. So you have cleared it uh, because it suited us to have a, a business uh, area there. Okay. So a lot of things have happened that way. Yeah. Okay. Omkar, you can ask your second question now. Omkar, are you there? Yes. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Sir, thank you for introducing us to this new word, misanthropes. Henceforth, I would have a concrete answer whenever someone asks me to define myself in one word. Especially since the result of this 2016 US elections came out. So, uh, my question is, you know, if you could please uh, share your views on implications of US withdrawal from Paris climate agreement. <laughs> no, I'm not sure whether misanthropes is such a great word, but anyway. Uh, but uh, before, uh, okay, the main thing is, uh, if you look at the U.S., U.S. is about 6 or 7 percent of the population. It consumes 25 to 40 percent of the world's energy. Okay. Uh, not just Paris uh, climate, uh, the uh, climate change agreement. U.S. walked out in 2000 out of the Kyoto uh, climate uh, this thing. And therefore, the uh, U.S. has not been honoring its commitment right from 2000 and much less. So in terms of uh, a country which is controlled by uh, the economically powerful, okay, uh, will always tend towards ensuring that the interests of that group is not drastically affected. Uh, you know, uh, have you heard of somebody called uh, Thomas Kocheri? Thomas Kocheri was uh, uh, one time, for a long time, he was the president of the All India Fisher Folk Agitation. He was a Jesuit priest and he used to uh, fire, he fought for coastal communities for a lot of laws uh, which the government implemented. So in 2005, he was given the uh, Paul Getty Prize. Okay? And in 2005, the prize carried $5 million. So for his organization, $5 million in 2005 was a big amount. He refused to accept it. Because he said that the Getty family is in petroleum, and petroleum and dollars and all of them are part of the same industrial complex. So if I accept the money from them, I'm legitimizing their business. Okay. Second, if you look at uh, in the UK, uh, uh, they, there is a there was a term in I think in 2009-10 called uh, greenwashing. What is greenwashing? Companies like Imperial Chemicals would give an NGO like Worldwide Fund for Nature uh, $10 million. Okay. And there's a lot of publicity for that gesture. And uh, they were one of the biggest polluters because of the kind of toxic elements in paints. So, unless industry becomes far more serious and decides uh, to uh, change. So, uh, companies like IKEA, etc., they have responded to uh, criticism and things like that. So, a lot of com all companies will have to change. Okay. Companies will have to take care of uh, cradle to grave, so all of that. So, therefore, the business interest is massive. Okay. So, in different places, different, like they say in Mumbai city, a lot of the decisions are controlled by people for it to real estate, because that's where the biggest money is. So powerful business interests will always uh, push us out of solutions which are in the best interest of a lot of us. Okay. Uh, Art Khandewal asks, uh, do you feel that restoration of coral reefs in India should be given equal importance or attention as the restoration of river gets? See, the problem with coral reefs is it's, it's far more difficult uh, because it's a very fragile ecosystem. Uh, protection is because sometimes there is this whole bleaching of coral spaces and suddenly uh, the ocean temperature increases, the uh, algae gets thrown out. And uh, so there's uh, so uh, people are still studying uh, not all algae is thrown because the understanding of in terms of how to manage coral reefs is still very, very preliminary. Uh, 
so that has to be done of course people are wondering how to uh, you know the great barrier reef they say 75% dead uh, so coral reefs are important but in terms of uh, for me in terms of uh, protecting rivers will be far more important they nourish uh, they do a lot of things and they also manage the eco balance better so i would definitely feel that yes but we will need to protect corals but restoration of corals i'm not sure there's enough science at the moment which can help it happen uh, successful yeah. uh, there is another question by him uh, the world economic forum spoke about how hybrid solar wind system should be promoted in india what is your take on that see the problem is in india again uh, a lot of people have used uh, the wind farm basically to buy land at very cheap prices they got uh, a lot of subsidy from government uh the wind energy experiment solar energy experiment in india has been um uh, i think it's they not lived up to their promise so first you have to make them work because a lot of these sector people uh, kind of take because they, they get a lot of other benefits they benefit from i mean they uh, use those uh, uh benefits and don't really deliver on their promises and energy Uh, I don't know how many of you are uh, familiar with the company called Parshuram Puri. Uh, they are the ones who, at one time, in uh, they were selling these uh, green bonds. They said you pay so much money uh, in twenty years or thirty years, you will get teak trees uh, and things like that. And they divert a lot of the money for other uh, real estate projects. So we need to find out the authenticity and whether how it works. And maybe more than this hybrid thing, what local communities have come up with. uh are there any interesting innovations within india which can be which can serve better all that we can look at yeah uh with this we come to the end of the session we have